this morning, if you have a Bible, only two passages of Scripture. They're long, but right, just two passages of Scripture that we're going to touch on this morning. Of course, it's Resurrection Sunday, right? And we, you know, um, some, some more traditional churches, you walk around and, and there's kind of a common saying. And people will say to you, he is risen. And what do people say in response? He is risen oh, are you guys like Catholic or Lutheran? Everybody knows, right, right? That's what you say, right? That's typically what you do, right? You celebrate Resurrection Sunday. That's why we have church on Sunday, not Friday, not Saturday, But we have church on Sunday. Every time you show up to church on a Sunday, you are reminding yourself of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That today is the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us the resurrection of Jesus is the most important event in history. All of Christianity is founded upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If it happened, then it changes everything about our lives and what we believe about the Bible and what we believe about what Jesus Christ said. If the resurrection indeed has happened, if it didn't happen, then it also changes everything that we believe about Christianity and about what Jesus said. It all revolves around the resurrection of Jesus. You know that the resurrection of Jesus is what separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. Like there's lots of things about Christianity that you'll find elements of in lots of other religions. Like the Ten Commandments. You'll see lots of the Ten Commandments in other religions, aspects of it. You'll see things like the Noah's Ark story, a flood story in other religions. You'll see elements of that. But what you will not see in any other religion is a resurrection story, the story of what Jesus Christ has done and his sacrifice on the cross and his rising from the dead again three days later. It separates Christianity from every other religion. It's the most important, fundamental thing about Christianity. You can't be a Christian and not believe in the resurrection. Like you can't. It's not possible to be a Christian without believing in the resurrection. And you need to ask yourself this morning, well, do I believe? And why do I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're not gonna turn there yet, but in 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle Paul's writing, and he's writing 20 years later after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's writing to a church probably similar to ours, maybe similar size as ours. And he wants to give them, he says, hey, I I know some of you guys, it's been 20 years And Jesus hasn't returned yet. And some of you might be struggling with your faith and questions and doubts. And he says, I want to give you some assurance. I want to remind you guys about what you've been taught and why you believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And then he writes those things out for them and reminds them. And we're going to get to those in a second. But before we do, if you have a Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 27. If you don't, that's okay. You can follow along on the screen behind me, those of you who are watching online, right? Matthew chapter 27 and 28. It's a little bit long passage, right? And then we're going to dive into uh, 1 Corinthians 15. But Matthew's writing and he's recording the event of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Matthew records these words for us and he tells us the resurrection story of Jesus Christ. Matthew 27, starting verse 45, says, At noon, as Jesus is on the cross, at noon, darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock. At about 3 o'clock, as Jesus is on the cross, he, Jesus calls out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders, they misunderstood and they thought that Jesus was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them, one of the bystanders, ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to Jesus on a reed stick so that he could drink. But the rest said, no, no, wait. Let's see whether or not Elijah comes to save him, to rescue him, to get him off of this cross. Then Jesus shouted again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, at the moment He died. The curtain in the sanctuary, what separated the Holy of Holies, that inner place that that represented God's presence from everybody else, and that, that curtain that was six inches thick, at that moment when Jesus died, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from the top all the way to the bottom. 
symbolizing, representing that the, pre, the access into God's presence at that moment was open. The earth shook, rocks, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. I'll never forget our oldest son. I don't know how old he is. I think he's 29 or 30, but he's something like that. Um, when we were in Dayton and we were at our first church and well, not our first, but our second church, and we were there, and one time we were having a play going on. It was about Resurrection Sunday and all the events, and this particular passage was being portrayed at that moment. And all of a sudden, you know, things are, lightning's kind of going off and, you know, earth-shaking sounds. And Spencer, who was, I don't know, four or five or six, you know, I'm bad with details, you could ask Debbie, but, you know, he was four or five or six. All the stuff is happening, and like a four-year-old, he leans over to me and he says, that's when the veil in the temple was torn. How does a five-year-old know that? I have no idea. It had to have been his mom. But he recognized, like, whoa, this is what the Bible is talking about. Access into God's presence has now made way for all of us. Verse 57 says, as the evening approached, Joseph, a rich man from Arimathea, who had become a follower of Jesus, he goes to Pilate and he asks Pilate for Jesus' body. And Pilate issues an order to release his body to him. And Joseph took the body and he wrapped it in a long sheet of clean linen cloth. And he placed it in his own new tomb, which had been carved out of the rock. And then he rolled a great stone across the entrance and he left. Both Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting across from the tomb. And they were watching all this take place, Jesus being buried. The next day on the Sabbath, the leading priests and the Pharisees went to see Pilate. And they told him, they said, Pilate, we remember what Jesus, this liar, this deceiver, once said while he was still alive. They remembered the words of Jesus. And they said this, quote, after three days, I will rise from the dead. So, Pilate, we are requesting that you seal this tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and telling everyone he was raised from the dead. If that happens, Pilate, we'll be worse off than we were at first. Pilate replied, take your guards and secure it the best that you can. So they sealed the tomb and they posted guards to protect it. Matthew 28. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was this great earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone and sat on it. His face shone like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women and they said, don't be afraid, he said, I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. Jesus isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come and see where his body was lying. Verse 7. And, though now, and, and now, the angel said, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him here. Matthew paints the picture and tells the incredible story, the event that changed history, the most important event. Matthew tells us, the Gospels tell us, the resurrection story of Jesus Christ. But Paul is writing, Paul who wrote most of the New Testament, he's writing 20 years later. Again, he's writing to a church much like ours who are beginning to question and doubt. You know, I don't know if there's things going on in their lives. They're not sure, you know, do I want to believe this? Am I, am, I, am I beginning to question this? And Paul writes to this church, and he reminds us, and he reminds us of the story, and he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Paul's writing, and he says to this church, he says, hey guys, I want to remind you about something. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of this incredible good news that I preached to you before. I've already told you this. And what is this good news that Paul wanted to remind them of? Verse 3 says, I want to remind you that I passed on to you what was the most important. As you think about Christianity, as you think about following Jesus Christ, 
Paul's like, I want to remind you of what's the most important thing about Jesus Christ. Other translations use the word what's of first importance. Another translation says what's most important or what's the greatest of importance. And this is one Greek word, protos. It means first or best or superior. It's almost as if nothing else about Christianity matters unless you believe this about Jesus Christ. In 1911, there's a, um, a physicist, his name is Ernest Rutherford, and he somehow split an atom, and there was the nucleus, and then he named the inner parts of the atom, he named it the proton, and he uses that same word, protos, meaning first. He used the exact same word to describe this important event. And Paul's like, hey guys, I want to remind you what's the most important, as you think about everything about following Jesus Christ, as you think about everything about Christianity, you've got to know what's most important. And he says this in the next verse, in verse 3. Here's what's most important that you remember today. That Jesus died for our sins. That he was the sacrificial lamb for our sins. Just as the scriptures said that Jesus died for my sins. He paid the price for my disobedience. That I don't have to be guilty. I don't have to be condemned any longer. That Jesus didn't just die, but he was buried. And he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. Paul's like, guys, this is what's most important. This is why Jesus died. He died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised on the third day. On your notes, on the back side, on your notes, I wrote a couple fill-ins for you. Paul says, what's the first of first importance or what's the most importance about Christianity? Your little fill-in says, it's the resurrection. On Friday that Christ dies for our sins according to Scripture. The most important thing about Christianity is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the most important thing, Paul says. I want to remind you of, of that. First, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering. God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for my sin. Why? So that I could be made right with God through Christ. That's what it means to be born again. That's what it means to be spiritually alive. Everybody has a spirit. Some people are spiritually alive. Some people are spiritually dead. To be spiritually dead means that you are not in right relationship with God the only way is through Jesus Christ. Some of you in this room have been born again. You are spiritually alive. You are in right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be spiritually alive. God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for my sins so that I could be made right with God through Christ. Paul says, that's what's most important. I'm reminding you of this. That on Friday and on Saturday that he was buried. And then on Sunday that he was raised on the third day according to scriptures. Again, it is impossible to be a Christian and not fully embrace the resurrection. I think that's a feeling that you have. It's impossible to be a Christian and not fully embrace the resurrection. That's why we're here today, to celebrate, to remember that. There's a couple theologians and pastors and authors that would write and talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A guy named John Stott said this as he's writing about the resurrection. He said, Christianity is in its very essence a resurrection religion. The concept of the resurrection lies at the heart of Christianity. If you remove the resurrection, Christianity is destroyed. Randy Alcorn said, Christianity rises or falls on the resurrection. If this event is historically true, it makes all other religions false because Jesus claimed to be the only way to God. To prove this, he predicted he would rise from the dead three days after his death, and he did. One more, Dr. Timothy Keller said this. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what Jesus said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teachings. That's not the important thing, but whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. It's the cornerstone, the most fundamental thing about Christianity. 
is did Jesus rise from the dead? Now, there's a lot of important things about Christianity, but it's not the cornerstone. I've asked some volunteers. How many of you guys have played Jenga? Raise your hand if you've played Jenga. Okay, that's not very many of you. I know you guys are lying. More people have played Jenga. You guys are not helping me at all. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've never played Jenga. Okay, everybody. Okay, that's not thought. Now, okay, I've asked some volunteers. I picked them out ahead of time. Come on up, my volunteers. Let's give them a hand as they come on up, right? Yeah. Okay, thanks. That was... So, <clears throat> come on up, guys and girls. So, the object of Jenga, right, is to remove parts of... The, you know, you guys know. you got to remove parts without making the thing fall over. So you guys are going to have to remove parts without making it fall over. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, that's great. Okay, so uh, go ahead, guys. And um, Linda, we'll start with you. Uh, we'll start right here on the end. Go ahead. And there's a little hammer down at the bottom if you can't and you don't want it to fall over. Okay, this is... Well, oh, okay, all right, okay, okay, all right, Christy, Christy, go ahead. Oh, that was easy, all right, okay, no clapping, no clapping, no clapping yet, because, oh, look at that, Hannah, that was cheating, all right, okay, go ahead, that was good, good, good job, Hannah, that was easy, it was really easy, all right, okay, okay, all right, Jack? All right, Jack, okay. Making me nervous on that, Maddie. Oh, all right, okay, okay, all right. All right. Okay, good job, Lauren. All right, Ken. There you go, okay, all right. All right, last one, okay. I'll help her out there, Jack, maybe. Yeah, there you go. There you go. All right, okay, okay. All right, so, all right, so none of it fell over. That was a good thing. All right, so, so all of you guys have some things that, are, that have to do with Christianity. Like, if this is supposed to what, represent Christianity, okay, why don't you guys read? Linda, what do you have? What does yours say? Infant, adult, baptism, or Okay, infant, adult, Infant or adult baptism, sprinkle or dunk. Like, baptism is really important, right? You know, it's important getting baptized, being obedient. But whether you get as, a, as an infant or as an adult, whether you're sprinkled or you're dunked, I mean, if that was the most important thing, then the thief on the cross is in a lot of trouble because he didn't get baptized. It's important, but is it as important as the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, no, of course not. No. All right, Chrissy. Oh, all right. Whether you're Catholic or you're Methodist or Lutheran or you don't have a denomination, like that's important to think about in following Jesus Christ. Is it the most important thing? No, it's a part of Christianity, right? All right, go ahead, Hannah. Okay, right. All right, what kind of Bible translation you like or you prefer? It's important to think about that. Is it the most essential? No. All right, go ahead. Music, Christian, or whether it's secular music. Like, the, you know, the Bible, you know, we're supposed to listen to things that are edifying and encourage us. But whether it's Christian music or secular music, we all know that we should only be listening to Gabe. But beyond that, right, I mean, it's important, but okay, is it the most? No, it's not. All right, Jack. All right, right. Gifts of the Holy Spirit. Are they meant to be active in our lives or not? Of course it's important. Not most essential thing, Maddie. Alcohol, right? Whether you drink, whether you don't drink. I mean, for some people, it's an addiction, it's an idol, and it's not wise. It's not beneficial. For other people, they have the freedom. Is it important? Of course it is. Is it the most important thing? No, it's not the most important thing. It's not the foundational thing. All right, Lauren. Once saved, always saved. Uh, once saved or, or always saved. Or can you walk away from your salvation? I mean, you should think about that. That's important. That's a part of Christianity. Again, it's not the most fundamental thing about Christianity. It's not the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right. 3%, 5%, 10%, 25%. 
It's important. Jesus says that we should tithe. How much you should tithe? I don't know how much you should tithe. You should ask Jesus about how much you should tithe. Or maybe ask Ken, one of the two, right? I mean, you have to listen to what the Bible says, right? It's important. It's not the most fundamental thing. It's Christian. It's just a part of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Last one. Women pastors or men only pastors. Like lots of people want to talk about that. They want to have conversations about that. It's important. Paul would say whether it's, you can have women pastors or men pastors. That's not the most, that's not a first importance. That's not foundational. That's not most fundamental about following Jesus Christ. All these things are part of Christianity, but none of them are the foundation for Christianity. None of them are as important about the resurrection. If the resurrection didn't happen, then none of these things even matter. If the resurrection didn't happen, Paul says that is the most important. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? That's what he wants to know. Okay, why don't you give, give these guys a hand? You can go ahead and throw those on the ground right there. <laughs> give these guys a hand. <clears throat> Thanks, guys. <clears throat> so all those things are important, right? But none of them are as important as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I wrote on your notes that sometimes that there's this temptation to divorce the teachings of Jesus from the resurrection of Jesus. Like some people, they're like, oh yeah, I love what Jesus says about helping homeless people. Oh yeah, I love what Jesus says about, you know, loving your enemies. Oh yeah, but the resurrection, and we can't divorce the teachings of Jesus from the resurrection of Jesus. If the resurrection didn't happen, that no, then nothing that Jesus says is important. The Apostle Paul goes on, and he puts it like this in 1 Corinthians 15, 5, verse, 15, verse 5. He says, hey, listen, I want you guys to listen really hard, Paul says. And I want to remind you of four reasons, like proofs why you can trust and believe. He says, don't forget that Jesus was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. And after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Like, you can go check, although some have died. And then he was seen, third, by James, and later by all the apostles. And then, last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. G Paul's like, listen, there's all this evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. Like, Jesus' brother, we're told in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, that James, Jesus' half-brother, he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. None of his family did. John chapter 7, verse 5 says that they all thought that Jesus had lost it. I mean, what would it take for you to believe your brother was the Messiah, right? That was the question. All of a sudden, James goes from this skeptic and this doubter to believing that Jesus was the Messiah. Why? Because he knew that Jesus had been crucified. And he saw him resurrected. James knew that. All the, all the disciples, right, they gave their lives. Peter, who hid and was, in, was afraid and, you know, all these terrible things about him. His life was transformed. Why? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you know that, that 10 or 11 out of the 12 disciples were martyred for their faith? That Peter, he was crucified but Peter wasn't crucified right side up. Peter was crucified upside down. He, didn't, he believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like who gives their life for a myth or for a lie or for a fairy tale? Yet all the disciples were martyred for their faith because they believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul, who persecuted Christians, saw the resurrected Jesus and gives his life for Jesus Christ, is decapitated, is beheaded, we're told, he believed in the resurrection. You know, for me, you know, all these people see and, you know, 2.6 or 2.4 billion people claim to be Christ followers. But for me, one of the strongest evidence is life change that I see in people's lives. The change that, that goes on in people's lives. You know, at first service, I was reminded of this. We had a gentleman that was, that was here first service who, as far as I know, was not a Christ follower, was raised in another, um, a, another faith outside of Christianity. But yet he had seen these other guys in my life group. And he all of a sudden just started coming to our life group because he'd seen so much life change in these guys. And he didn't know necessarily that they were Christians. But he had seen what a difference their lives were from his own life. He's like, whatever's going on in these guys' lives, I want it in my own life. 
for him, that was evidence like, whoa, there's something about Christianity that I need to check out. Why do you believe? Is it the life change that you see around you? Is it the fact that all these disciples, they gave their life, they were martyred for their faith? Paul lists all these reasons that we can believe and trust in the resurrection. Paul goes on, he finishes up our passage in verse 14. He says, if Christ has not been raised, like if this is all make-believe, then all of our preaching is useless. And your faith is useless. And we apostles, we're all liars about God. For we have all said that God raised Christ from the dead. From the dead. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, they all said the same thing. Like if it didn't happen, then they're all liars, Paul says. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection from the dead. Verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. Like if it didn't really happen, if Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, then everybody that you love that said that they're a follower of Jesus Christ, guess what? They're just in the ground. They're just in a hole in the ground and game over. That's it. End of story. Everyone's lost. And if our hope is in Christ, it's only for this life. If there is no resurrection, we are more to be pitied than anyone else in the world. This Swedish guy, Jarsoflin Pelican, I don't know how to say his name. He said this, if Christ is risen, nothing else matters. And if Christ is not risen, nothing else matters. The resurrection of Jesus is either the greatest lie given to humanity or the resurrection of Jesus is the greatest event in history. There is no middle ground. There is no middle ground. Jesus is either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he really is the Lord. The resurrection. Do you believe? It's the cornerstone. I'm going to ask the worship team, they're going to come up. The resurrection is the cornerstone, right? Kind of our takeaway is, is we think about this, um, when we think about this morning is, is, is the resurrection and how, again, all these things, you know, things like this are important, right? Baptism is important. Infant, adult, sprinkle, dunk, immersion, music is important. The kind of Bible translation I look at is important. Whether you're Methodist, whether you're Catholic, yeah, that's important. You know, once saved, always saved. Alcohol, no alcohol. You know, gifts of the Holy Spirit. All these things are important, but none of them are fundamental. None of them are foundational. None of them are as important as the resurrection. Everything about Christianity is built upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It all centers around the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything. Everything about Christianity. And what happens? You know, those things are important. But if you remove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, man. Three services. If you remove it. Right? If you remove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything about Christianity falls. It all is centered around that. I wrote a couple of scriptures on, my, on, on, on this block. Isaiah 28, 700 years before Jesus, there was this prophecy. And God was speaking through Isaiah. And God said this, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and a tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes will never, ever be shaken. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says again, I passed on to you what was most important. Christ died for our sins. Christ was buried and he raised and he was risen from the dead on the third day. If not, nothing about Christianity matters. As I thought about our takeaway this morning, because of the resurrection, I can believe in Jesus Christ. Because of the resurrection, I can believe, I can trust him. I can follow Jesus Christ because he rose from the dead. Because of the resurrection, I can be born again. I can be made in right relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. I can become come alive spiritually. Because of the resurrection, I can be forgiven. I don't have to live in condemnation. I don't have to live in guilt. Because of the resurrection, I can be a new person and change. I don't have to be the same way I've been for the last 25, the last 30 years. Because of the resurrection, 
I can have hope now in life eternity. Because of the resurrection, I can have eternal life. You know, we're all going to live eternally. It's just a matter of where you live eternally. With God, new heaven, new earth. With God or separated from God in hell. I can have eternal life because of the resurrection. I wrote a simple prayer out. And some of you maybe have never trusted Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you, if you've never trusted Christ, you can pray along with me. Nate, it's the next slide. You can go ahead and pray along with me. It's just a simple prayer that I wrote out. And you can just pray this prayer this morning. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for the things that I've done wrong in my life. I'm sorry when I have gone against you in your way. Jesus, please forgive me. I now turn from everything that I know is disobedient to you. Thank you that you died on the cross for me and are alive today so that I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your spirit. I now receive that gift. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit to be with me forever. Today, I choose to believe, trust, and follow you, Jesus, for the rest of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.